I started knitting five years ago and it quickly turned into a full-blown obsession. So now I'm on a journey of learning how can one become a better knitter and I want to invite you to join me. I'm going to interview different instructors, knitwear designers, book authors, people who are very well respected in the knitwear industry. And my first guest today is an Italian knitwear designer, Dario Tubiana. So you've been teaching at work now. Um, when it comes to learning, do you think we need the feedback of the instructor? Do we think we need the, that feedback of the technical expert? Because, you know, there is this whole YouTube university, right? Where you can go on YouTube and you can find any information you want to find. You can find any technique, you can find tutorials. So the question becomes like how important the feedback for our improvement, because if we just go on YouTube and we learn, look at tutorial, we don't really know if that tutorial gives us correct information, if it's actual scientific truth, right? Or if there's somebody who thinks they're doing the right thing and who thinks they know what they're doing actually feeds us some false information. And we also don't know if we actually understood what the person is trying to say and they're doing it correctly, right? Like, what's your feeling? How important is the actual feedback to becoming a better knitter? Well, um, I think that um, video on YouTube and tutorials are extremely important for, for anyone. I mean, we all go there and we all watch them. And uh, But of course, there is that thing that you were talking about, I mean, that feel of, uh, the feeling of insecurity you know when you you see something you try but you, uh, you you're not sure you're doing something properly um that's pretty normal so i think that it's rather personal i mean there are a lot of people who um i don't know they manage to work and to make up things just by watching tutorials and there are some other people who are very insecure not in a bad sense but simply they need to be guided okay they need the sort of leader who tells you this is the correct way to do it so i think it's it's rather personal however i have to say that uh, having had a lot of students recently who um, after the um, this this covid period where we were all forced at home and watching tutorial all the time or taking classes online right. online classes um, they, I got to know that most of them were not able to knit properly. I mean, they were knitting like through the back loop because on, on tutorial, even though people is showing something correctly, um, if you learn to knit, uh, on, on, on YouTube, you might, uh, stumble across this kind of mistake because you don't really realize. So I was really appreciating the fact that I was teaching to people who learn to knit watching uh, YouTube uh, tutorials. However, there were some kind of mistakes that I had to adjust uh, and I had to fix because they were just doing things wrong. Okay, so I think that um, in-person classes or to have somebody who teach you uh, in, in person, it's really important for, for someone who feels um, insecure about it or or, does, or wants or also for very curious people you know where somebody is very curious like for example I'm a very curious one and I'm, I'm always very eager to ask question and of course if you look at, 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 at YouTube you have to be happy with what they're telling you otherwise you will have to to, to watch another tutorial so you know um, it's really personal in my opinion but of course having somebody right next to you telling you no don't do this do that because it's so much better it's going to help out a lot. Well, if you think about it, like historically, when people were knitting, it was usually generational things. So your mother, grandmother, aunt would teach you and they would watch you and they would correct you, right? So we had that built-in system of tutors and yeah. the mentors, and we don't necessarily have it now with all the technology out there and all the tutorials out there. So, it's, you know. Yes, absolutely. Yesterday, I was having a look at my Instagram, and uh, I was watching the first video of mine, and uh, it was me learning to knit with my mom, and um, and I and 
I had a lot of memories related to, to that. And I remember that after a couple of days that she had taught me to knit and purl, I, I took a trip to Rome. And when I was in Rome, I took out my needles and I don't know, a, a stitch had fallen or something. And I was uh, totally lost. So I called her and I was video called her to show her to tell me what to do because I had no absolutely no idea. Um, so yeah, it's a generational thing. I mean, I used to have my mom next to me to to tell me, do this, don't do that. How do I increase? How do I decrease? So uh, yes, uh, we we have that kind of system. Well, uh, you also like, you do something that not a lot of people do. You do embroidery on knitting. And yeah. so my question is, how is embroidery on knitting different from regular embroidery on canvas, right? Like, does that take different skill set and how, because like, there is not that much information out there about that. What was your learning process about that? Well, yeah, so uh, on um, embroidery on knitwear, it's uh, almost the same thing because the stitches are the same. However, um, since the fabric is different, um, there are some particular things that you need to take care uh, not to do or to do before. Uh, so, for example, the tension of the fabric is extremely important, so learning um, to um, thread the yarn and learning to stitch with wool instead of with uh, with cotton, which is, you know, it's are different things. You're also working with um, with a yarn which is thicker compared to, you know, the regular embroidery yarn. So um, that's uh, very that's somehow difference. However, um, I say again, stitches are almost the same. So we use the same stitches. Um, my mom hates to embroider, so um, I didn't learn from her. And um, during all that COVID period, I was at home, and that was really the moment when I had a chance. Well, I was very free. I had a lot of free time, so I had all the time to experiment, to try to to make mistakes, to learn, to read back things, and start again. So yeah, um, my um, I I learned by trying. I mean, in my my experience. Uh, trying things it's always the best way to learn because you really you can feel what you do you can see what you do and uh, that's the best things to learn um, a technique so you have to try so my process was, was sort of like that to try to understand and the more you do it the more you understand what you can do and what you can't do so that's well, how I there is this um, pursuit of perfection that we all sort of have right is perfection the real thing or is just the concept that we were fed to believe exists? Like, how do you stop yourself from being too critical of what you do? Um, I start when I feel satisfied, which is, uh, I think it, and I think that it's my, my, my goal. I mean, I want to be satisfied. I, I want to look at something and be sort of proud of what I did. And I want to say, yes, I like it um so and it doesn't matter if it's perfect or not uh, usually when i'm satisfied for me it's perfect of course for somebody else no it's not perfect but uh, i think the most important is to be satisfied of what you do because after all those are all, are all things that are supposed to make you happy eventually not only mm, to make somebody else happy they need to make you happy so um uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not looking for perfection. I'm looking for my satisfaction when I do it. So I think that's well, my... Is that even more difficult to achieve than perfection? <laughs> it's knitwear and it's still knitwear. And there are a lot of things. Sometimes we get very involved in, in our project and we want them to be perfect. And we forget that after that there are a lot of things that they will adjust when you block your knitting, when you wear it once, when you wear it twice, when you iron it. So there are a lot of things that will eventually fix by themselves. So I, I don't want to push it too much. When I feel it's good, when I feel I like it, and uh, and when I feel I reached the, the final outcome I wanted to achieve, I'm good. And I just drop my needles. Well, I mean, you are a very interesting guy to me because there are people who enjoy knitting, right? And they can achieve whatever picture they want to put on a sweater by Antarja or, you know, by the stranded color work, and they're very satisfied with that. 
you have the need to take it on a completely different level. Like you are not satisfied with Justin Tarja, which you do use in your sweaters. You are not yeah. satisfied with just stranded color work, which you do also use in your techniques. You need to bring embroidery on top of that. And even that, like you go through the whole process of like printing it, making sure it fits the size. I mean, to watch you work is like very fascinating to me. What do you think makes you want to add another dimension to what you do already? Uh, well, I didn't want to work with too many colors on strand and knitting and in Tarsha. I mean, it's very, it's very easy. Um, I, I, I like colors. So I, I, I like using a lot of colors. So I, I've started with strand and knitting. Then I learned Intarsha and I began working with Intarsha. And uh, after that, I, you know, with embroidery, it's somehow once you manage to master em embroidery, it's rather easy to use 100 colors on one garment because it's, you don't have floats on the back, you don't have to worry about floats, you don't have to work um, to worry about um, you know, bobbins of yarn for intarsha. So the main reason that brought me there, that brought me to to embroidery, was just to add some other colors onto um, onto my knits. So a very a very simple reason. I of course also like the three D aspects of it. So because when I've studied a little bit more about knitwear, you know, the manipulation of the fabric, it's something that um, intrigues me a lot. So, and embroidery, you know, working with a needle, with a, with an embroidery needle on a, a surface allows you to let you to manipulate the, the fabric as you like. And, and that is a whole new world that opens up and uh, allows you to do amazing things really. So, um, that's also another reason that uh, brought me to embroidery. So now that you're teaching at Vogue and you've been teaching in other places as well, how did that change you? Like, do you feel like you're an expert? Do you feel like you're learning something new every day? Do you feel like you're learning something from your students? Um, well, you know, um, from students, I always learn. I, I've been teaching at BOG, I've been teaching knitwear and embroidery at university since uh, three years now. It's It's been three years now. And uh, it's a constant learning because, you know, people come up with crazy questions, beautiful questions, and uh, uh, sometimes you simply do not have the answer. And uh, but I think one of the most important engines in for creativity is the curiosity. So if you if you're curious about the question, you will automatically begin thinking, how can I do that? How uh, can I help her out? Uh, so yes, I learn a lot every time I teach, every time I'm I I'm, I do my classes or I'm at university. It's it's incredible, man. They keep giving, even though you think you know something they put you through something that you say oh god how am i going to do that how am i going to work this out but eventually uh so well not eventually you don't always manage to give an answer i mean it's not um so uh, automatic but um that is a great way to learn new things and to and to yeah so it's very stimulating let's say let's put it that way well another thing that I love about you there are people who need all their life and they're very satisfied with like whatever they need right like whatever they already know and it's familiar it's easy for them and this is what they concentrate on then there are people like you who like come into knitting and want to know the most difficult techniques out there want to know that and that and get to the point when you actually teach it right what do you think it takes to be a better knitter to to wanna learn all of these things. Like, what sets you apart from other knitters? Uh, well, first of all, I do it for a living, which is uh, which is definitely something that uh, makes it different. So when people say, uh, "I just want to go back home, sit in front of the telly, and knit," 
I say, I just can't wait for uh, 6 p.m. for put down my needles and do something else. So, uh, you know, doing this for a living puts you through, puts you on the shoulder of the responsibility to be up to date, to learn new things and to propose a new project to your, to people who follows you or who wants to come to your class or simply people who wants to learn new things. And um, so, and, and, Another thing is, as I said before, is that you need, I, I think people um, sometimes want, people who are curious uh, tends to want to learn more or, or tends to have a lot of questions about how to do something, um, uh, how to, how may I create that effect? And so all those things brings you to learn um, techniques and that kind of uh, drive uh, prevent you for thinking if for or for um, pre preventing from um, pondering if those techniques are or aren't complicated. You don't care. You just want to get to know them. So uh, this approach makes them a lot easier to learn, and uh, or at least this is this is for me. So I never really had problems trying techniques or for me, it's really, it, it's very important. I would, because, you know, when you knit, it's, it's always when you, um, it, it's like when you learn a new language. Okay. So if you want to communicate, 10 words are enough. I mean, people will understand you. If you want to explain yourself, to express yourself, if you want to express concept, you need to know many words, many structure con and constructions. Same thing is for knitting. And if you want to knit in the round and not being able to purl, that's fine if you feel good with it. And you can also be very creative with that. But at a certain time, not knowing other stitches will eventually be a limitation uh, so my approach is like to learn as much as I can and if I don't like it I can leave it there but you know learning a lot of techniques allows you to first of all to choose whether to use it or not and secondly allows you to to express yourself the way you want to be because now you could be very comfortable expressing yourself through guard a stitch but tomorrow something in your life might happen and you might want to express yourself in brioche and uh, that's going to entail a lot of work and, and, and understanding. So, um... well, when it comes to languages, right, there are people who sort of don't care. They want to communicate more than they care about making mistakes, right? They'll just plow through and somehow they're going to be understood by the person yeah. they're trying to communicate with. And then there are people who feel like unless they can perfectly express themselves, they are too shy to even try to communicate, right? And they stop themselves from improving by just being timid and by thinking they're not good enough. And it's the same exact thing in not only knitting, but like in everything else in life, yeah, right? Yeah. Right. So how do we push ourselves outside of our comfort zone? How do we prevent fear from stopping us becoming better at whatever we want to do? Well, I can, I can, I don't, I, I, I don't know about life. Of course, I'm not even going there. Uh, let's stick to knitting. And um, what I can say is um, that there's nothing to be afraid of. I mean, uh, knitting as a magical thing, knitting and crochet or uh, embroidery as something which is incredible. If you think about it, you can knit back. Okay, you can unravel everything and you can still use the yarn. Okay, we don't have that possibility in life. I've, I've always wanted to have to be able to go back a couple of years and start again and see if I can make better choices, for example. But in life, we cannot do that. In eating, we can. So that's a gorgeous thing. And um, so there's nothing to be afraid of. I mean, we can just knit and make mistakes, rip back and start again. I mean, it's, it's, it's no problem. And this is one of the things that makes you uh, a better knitter, in my opinion. It's because it's sort of, you know, you just have to um, 
throw away all of the fears about making mistakes or about wasting your time uh, because it's never wasted. I mean, those that time, it's time you invest anyway even even if there's a mistake in it and you have to and you take two days to make a swatch instead of one because the first watch was wrong it doesn't matter i mean you learn something so it's it, it's always really good and i think that people sometimes it's always very much afraid of timing okay sometimes people people think that would they say it's very difficult to things that are actually very easy but take a long time to do to, to do so um, there is this misconception. So it's not that everything is difficult. There are some things that are very easy, but take a long time to do. And um, like, for example, if you have to, de to do a sweater in, uh, uh, in stocking stitch, and if you have to do a sweater in one color brioche, one color brioche, basically it's very easy, but it's much longer than stocking stitch. So you will take just a few days more. So um people sometimes it's, it's, it's also stopped by these things of mm, it looks very um, a very complex uh, design because i'm gonna make uh, it, it's gonna take me ages and that's very true for most of my designs which uh in which uh, have embroidery on it embroidery is not something that you do overnight and so um i can understand that sometimes people is stopped by that but if it's a hobby, timing shouldn't be a problem. It's so funny because I was knitting, I was test knitting my first sweater once and I made this stupid mistake. It was like absolutely like silly mistake because I was concentrating on the brioche section and I just like missed a couple of the increases or something like that. It was like absolutely like a rookie mistake. And I had to basically like frog the whole day of work and I was talking to a friend of mine and I said you know like I can't believe I did such a rookie mistake and I had to un undo the whole day of knitting and he's like I don't know nothing sounds bad about it because I hear a whole day of knitting so you're gonna have another whole day of knitting ahead of you it's like it all sounds good you know so it's also mm -hmm. like depends on how you look at it like if there is no deadline basically for majority sure. of us exactly uh, the deadline issue it's a really good issue so if there's no deadline it's only fun well, when you talk about um, self-doubts, right, we have this thing that commonly called uh, imposter syndrome, where we say, well, what do I know? Like, I'm not an expert. Do you get that as well, like in your teaching? Oh, no, never. Sorry. I, I, I really do not want to sound conceited, but um, I, um, I'm a really good teacher in things I know. So... Um, I don't want to teach things um, I, I'm not sure about or I have doubts about. I mean, if I know something, I, I want to be honest to myself, true to myself and say, I know it. So, OK, uh, if I if, if I have doubts, I, I, I don't want to fake it I and mean, I, I don't know it. So I will not pretend to know something I barely know or i hardly know or i hardly understand most of the time because i have this approach to things i teach or to things in general in life i know i i tend not to and i think this is very important in order to be a good knitter or to be a good at most of the things in life i try not to um I don't care to learn new things i want to understand things and and it, it's subtle the difference it's subtle but to learn is that thing that you're learning in that specific contest on that specific project. And if you forget it or if you change project, you have to start again and or you have to go and look for it. If you understand the concept and, and, and the technique, you are able to use it in different stages and in, in different projects. And this is so true about brioche. You can try to learn brioche by heart that's really good but the, if, once you're knitting brioche somebody ring ring the bell you need to put down your project go open the door you come back you don't remember where you were and you will not be able to get around it get your head around it but if you understand what you're doing and why you are doing several stitches some cer uh, certain stitches you are going to do it uh, good and and to succeed in your project so for me understanding 
things instead of learning it's a good project that's why when i teach in my classes i i always say uh at the beginning that i don't care that my student uh, to go home with a nice little swatch with all the project very well embroidered i don't care and i don't actually want them to i want them to go home with a technique in their head because after all they don't care to have a nice swatch. I mean, that swatch is going to end up somewhere in their closet and they will forget about it. I want them to go home with a technique that they can embroider on uh, their knit or with Intarsha that they can do on some of their project. So this is what I like doing when I teach. So I don't, I know what I'm teaching and I don't have that kind of doubt uh, of myself. I, I'm quite good with that as long as we teach something I know. I actually really like that um, that idea of uh, understanding something versus learning it. Yeah, it's like it makes a difference. You made me think about it. <laughs> if you want to see more of my talk with Dario, I interviewed him in episode fifty nine, so you can watch that. I'll put the link in the description of this video. My next guest is Shayna Billo. Shayna is also a walk knitting instructor. She's been meeting for a long time and teaching for a long time. Here is Shayna. You know, like when people think about learning something new, there is two categories. There are people who understand, and those are usually more successful people, people who understand that to learn anything, you have to make a tons of mistakes, that mistakes are just what you expect, right? And then there are people who think, if they're making a mistake, it means that they are not good enough and they are not qualified to try that. So like if you think, for example, of juggling, right? You know for a fact that those balls are going to fall. It's just a part of learning how to juggle. So if you accept it as that's actually the expected, right? That the balls are going to fall. And if they don't fall, it's a pleasant surprise you eventually will learn how to juggle. But if you think like, if you throw the balls a couple of times and they fall and you're like, oh, I just like, I can't do that. There is very high probability that you'll never learn how to juggle. And I feel right. like it applies <laughs> to not only juggling, but like knitting as well and everything else in life and reality. Right. So you've been teaching a lot. You've been teaching in uh, yarn stores. You've been teaching at work. What do you think prevents people from learning? Um, fear, fear in themselves that they think that they can't do something, that they're incapable of learning something, um, or understanding something, um, sort of, I don't want to say a closed mindedness because I have so many beautifully open-minded people, but somehow, um, when we get to knitting, there's this closed mindedness of like, I can't do that. I'm not going to seem, I don't know how to pick up that stitch. I don't know how to read this pattern. And like, they just shut down. Um, and I, I don't know why that comes about, but I see it a lot with knitters. Um, fortunately, I'm lucky enough that with all my teaching, I have people coming to my classes to learn very specific techniques and they do believe in themselves in those classes. But I've noticed um, when I teach children, there's a fearlessness to them to just take in the information and make the mistakes and and be okay with it whereas when I teach adults there's a different mentality that they need to get it the first time around or they're a failure um so somehow between being a kid and being adult being an adult we get into that mindset of like I'm not if I don't get this right the first time around I'm going to it's not going to work out and and that's a shame so um that's I think a lot of what prevents knitters from excelling and from moving forward with their skills is getting in their own head and being afraid of it. Um, the other thing too is, you know, working sequentially is good. So you, you use that um, analogy of juggling. You wouldn't start juggling glass balls. You would start with something soft and squishy that falls on the floor and isn't going to break. And it's the same with knitting. If you start simple and just keep progressing and adding on a new skill each time you pick up a project, you are going to be a phenomenal knitter in no time at all. You have to keep challenging yourself and be ready for that. 
Well, where would you start with that? Like, what's the most essential skills a neither need to learn before progressing to anything else? I think for me, the most essential skill that I teach people um, is fixing mistakes. And beyond the fixing mistakes, part of it is the actual act of fixing an error in your knitting. But part of it is understanding how these stitches work together, how the rows work together, how everything stacks up so that you can see your work in a much more clear vision. Um, and so I think part, it's, it's a lot of being able to fix the mistakes so that when you make them, because we all are going to make mistakes, we're invariably going to drop those balls that we're juggling. Um, we're all going to drop a stitch. We're all going, our stitches are gonna fly off the needles. It, this is gonna happen. Um, but being able to look at that and not be afraid is what's important. And so part of that is understanding what your stitches look like so that as you're seeing your stitches on the needle, they all make sense whether or not you know, they've, if you've had an error, it's much more easy to spot. So for me, being able to fix errors and immediately see what's wrong with a pattern or what's wrong with what's on my needle um, is totally transformative for learning to be a better knitter. When um, throughout, at the beginning of quarantine, when I wasn't seeing students anymore and we were all just figuring out how to use Zoom and that kind of thing, like we weren't totally comfortable online yet people had to fix their own mistakes my students weren't coming to me to fix things and I have to say the people that stuck with it fixed the mistakes and kept knitting throughout the quarantine and throughout you know the uh, more intense part of the pandemic came out better knitters at the end and it was all because they looked at their knitting and they said well I'm gonna fix this and I can do it well so. let me ask you like a continued question to that how important in your view is to receive the actual feedback on your knitting from somebody versus figuring it out by yourself or going to YouTube for help? Because a lot of people saying that, yes, we're calling it YouTube University and that there is like a lot of faulty information out there as well. When people misname something or showing the technique that they don't fully understand themselves, but they demonstrate it. And you don't know who knows and who doesn't and what's right. where, what's not. Um, so it all depends what you want to get out of knitting, right? There are people who are very happy being their own checker and making sure that their knitting is just how they want it to be. And that's amazing. Great. You know, this is knitting is what you make of it and that's fine. Um, and you're right, I often warn my students before they go online to watch a free video on how to do something. I warn them, you know, anyone can make a video. Any self-taught person who may not be doing things correctly or maybe, you know, whatever it is, anyone can make a video. Um, so I actually, I ended up starting to make YouTube videos, quick ones, because I was trying to find videos on YouTube for my students to send them when I wouldn't, when I wasn't with them. And um, and I was I was coming up short. There are some people who are great, and I often will recommend those particular people. Um, but there were certain techniques that they weren't showing, so I started doing videos to fill that gap. So yeah, you have to be careful <laughs> who you're looking at. Um, and then in terms of being in person with a knitting professional, that's also invaluable. Uh, but it, again, it depends what you want out of your knitting. If you are feeling insecure, like you're not quite sure if what you're doing is right, it's always good to get another set of eyes on it, whether that's the, the knitter at your local yarn shop or going to a knitting convention and taking a class with the experts in the field. You know, there are so many, so many different places to go and get help with that. So again, since it's all hobby and fun, um, we're as long as you're happy knitting, it's great. Um, but if you want to start making your own YouTube videos for techniques, or if you want to start writing patterns, it's probably a good idea to make sure that you are working within the constraints of what, you know, the normal knitting is or conventional knitting would be. Yeah. Do you still learn things in knitting? Because like you were an instructor, do you, is that still a learning path for you? Yes, I do. And that's what's so exciting to me about knitting is there's always something to learn. Um, I recently taught a brioche 
workshop with a few other brioche teachers. Um, and I learned some things in that, you know, as a brioche instructor, I ended up learning other things in that workshop and um, the creative spark that you get from being in classes. It's, it's amazing as a teacher, even I feel it when I'm in a class and everyone's in this learning zone. Um, it's infectious. It really is infectious. So um, uh, yes, I still learn things with knitting. And I've noticed over the years, knitting has changed since I've been knitting. Um, when I started knitting, everything was on straight needles and um, short rows were done with wrap and turns. And, and then all of a sudden, German short rows started being more popular. And I thought to myself, oh, I have wrap and turns. Why do I need to do anything else? And then I did German short rows. And I was like, well, now I have German short rows. I don't need to do anything else. So there's always, there's always more to learn and more to discover and challenge. And that's what to me is so incredible about knitting especially oh, because it's just this creative endeavor with soft, squishy yarn. It's how lucky are we, right? That we get to learn and and change and be comforted all at the same time. Well, there so, are certain techniques that have a bad rap between the knitters, right? Like Brioche yes. being one of them, Intarja comes to mind. <laughs> Fair aisle, lots of times people are afraid of those floats and the tension and all of those things. And there's like a gazillion of other techniques that, you know, sticking, I mean, core stories, right? Yes. Um, do you have one that still scares you? I, I, when you said sticking, I got the chills. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I need to work on my sticking. And another one that scares me is in Tarja in the round. It's something I can't quite wrap my head around just yet. Whenever I see that class advertised, um, I think, oh, I should really do that and get out of my comfort zone um, to learn how it works to do in Tarja in the round because, yeah, it's just no sense to me. I, I need things to make sense, to line up, to be, to have a system. And to me, that just haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> well, when you think about having a system, right? And I talk about it with the king of Antarja, Rosso Cardinale, who is also a teacher at Wog Knitting. And we talked about Antarja and he basically said like that his thing is like, you can learn something and that might not help you in the future because then you can forget it or you can understand something and that's gonna help you forever, right? Because like, if you understand the concept of something, then you can always relearn the technique. You can re get reminded the technique, but you understand how it works like on a deeper level. Yes. So exactly. let's, talk, let's go back to understanding your knitting and why it's so important, right? How can it help you to like look at your knitting and immediately see those mistakes or catch like where the tension isn't even? Like how does it help you to become critical of your knitting and does it have this other side of like you being overly critical and then suddenly you're losing the pleasure of knitting because all you see is mistakes? Ah, okay. So for me, um, that's, that's a lot. Hold on, I have to think of which one I want to answer first. Um, so how, so being able to look at your stitches and just simply break it down into knitting is only two stitches, knit and purl, right? We either have a bump or we have a straight V. That's it. So if you can start breaking down knitting into that binary system, it becomes much more easy to fix mistakes, to see your patterns, to become a quicker knitter, to feel more confident in going forward with new patterns. Um, so I don't know that I would feel critical, overly critical of my knits. I think it helps. I think having this understanding of our stitches helps us lessen that criticism because there's more confidence that comes with looking at your work and saying, oh, it's just a combination of knits and pearls, like big deal, I got this. Um, or if you end up making a mistake and needing to rip back a little bit, like, aha, I see all of the stitches that I need on the needle and they're all in the right position or what have you. So um, yeah, it, uh, to me, it doesn't make it harder to be um, like more critical of yourself. And, and I have to say my knitting is not the tidiest knitting. 
I'm not a neat knitter. So when I knit in Tarja, for example, it's very funky on the edges. Um, so that's okay. I like it's, you know, again, I'm not knitting for awards. I'm knitting for pleasure. I'm knitting to make designs and, and get joy that way. Um, however, yes, I do get critical of that kind of thing. When I'm in a, if I were in a class where I was doing in Tarja, I might look a little more deeply at those stitches and think, hmm, okay, you know, this could be improved and then try to figure that out. But then I lose the joy of it when I start trying too much to figure it out and say, oh, well, I have to knit this way and do, do this to get those stitches to look just perfect. Yeah, that does take the joy from it. My feeling with knitting is that if you can decipher what you're looking at when you see your stitches, you will have a much easier time taking on new challenges, learning how to fix your mistakes, learning new patterns even, and just having your knitting be a much more pleasurable experience. So with this little sampler swatch here, I have a lot of combination combinations of different stitches here. I've got a garter stitch, I have a broken rib, stockinette stitch, and then I have a moss stitch. All of these patterns are simply combinations of two basic stitches, knit and purl. Right. So you may look at these and think, oh, wow, like that looks challenging or this is challenging. I know the garter stitch. That's cool. I know stockinette. Um, these are just combinations of different ways of joining your knits and purls. So when you start to break knitting down into its simplest form of just that binary structure, knit, purl, knit, purl, and seeing what those stitches end up looking like after you've created them, it does help. Um, open up a world of possibilities for you for knitting. So for example, on this swatch here, this this is what I use in my fixing mistakes class here. We have knit stitches, we have purl stitches, we have purls here on the front, knits on the back in that column. We can start breaking down our knitting into just what we're looking at in this one little section rather than the big picture, which is wonderful, right? We love big, big picture knitting and seeing what we're making. Being able to look at the small picture and just look at one stitch in front of you or the couple stitches in a little section can really help. So here I've got garter stitch, which is knitting every row, but you'll see it leaves texture on both sides, right? So what's knit on one side is a purl on the other. What's purl on one side is a knit on the other how our knitting breaks down. So if we're doing knit every row, we end up with a ridge on the front of the work and a ridge on the back of the work. If we're working knits on the front of our work here, we get a flat edge. And then when we come back and work curls, we get a bump towards us. And that creates the stockinette stitch here. Right. So once you get a sense of what your knitting stitches look like, and what they can do and purl stitches, the stitches in general look like. It's much easier then to seam pieces together, to fix mistakes, um, and generally just start knitting new patterns and things like that. So what I wanted to do today, in addition to talking about the knit stitch and purl stitch, show you how to fix a couple mistakes, um, both in stockinette and garter. And then I wanted to also show you how to seam your pieces together. Once you can see what your stitches look like, it's a little bit easier. So here I'm a continental knitter and I'm working the knit stitch. You'll notice as I work this stitch, what results on my right hand needle is a flat V, a little letter V like Victor. Here, I was working the wrong stitch for my stockinette. So I'm going to fix that now. I was working purls and you'll notice here as I purl a stitch, I get this bump right in the front. So our purls give us a bump and our knits leave us a flat stitch. Here, I want these stitches all to be flat. So I'm going to let this drop off the needle. And as I'm doing that, you'll see I've got these strands here. Each one of these strands represents a row that I had knit. So in this one column, this is one of the stitches. Let's, it's stitch number eight of my row and of, of my needle. 
And here I have row number 20, row number 19, row number 18, row number 17. And then row number 16 is this loop right here on the needle. So this is what knitting looks like when it comes apart. Each one of your rows becomes a strand in the back and each stitch will fall down in that row. Like they'll come straight down and you can grab the stitch here from this column. So one after another, I'm going to drag these stitches, drag these rows right through the stitch that's on my crochet hook. And I'm recreating my stitches now as knits because they had been pearls. I'm going to put that onto the left needle. You'll see when I get to the garter stitch on the other side here, it's a little different to pick up stitches. Yeah. So I'm working over my cable here. And you might think if you've never done cables, you might be freaked out looking at this cable here. Cables are just knitting stitches out of order. You'll see I'm knitting these stitches here. Every so often I'll stop, every couple rows I'll stop and take my first three stitches and cross them over my second three stitches. But it's still knits and purls. It's still just those simple basic stitches of knit and purl. So here I am in garter stitch. When we were working the stockinette before, we had everything all lined up. We had our knit stitches lined up on this side and our purl bumps lined up on this side. With garter stitch, those stitches reverse each other. Right? We have some knits on this side. Here's the knit, this nice little flat piece here. And then we have the pearls on this side too, this bump. So you might be thinking, well, Shana, garter stitch is all knit. How could that be that we've purled? We haven't, it's that we have that bump, that pearl look on the front. So I'm going to drop a couple stitches. And there are a few ways to pick up garter stitch, but I'll just show you quickly my favorite way. Here we go. I, I'm going to, we have these ladders again. Each of these are the rows that have been undone, but here's the column. Here's the stitch that pulls together all the rows. I'm going to insert my hook right in that column. And here I'm just above this bump, the pearl bump. So my next stitch that I pick up is going to be a knit. So that's this one here where I just come from in front and pull through. And you'll see I have that nice flat knit stitch. I'm going to now pinch that stitch closed and come from behind and pick up pearl wise. So you'll see there's my bump. My next stitch is a knit. From the front, I grab that bar. My next is a pearl. So from the back, I'm going to move that bar forwards and drag this through. And I have my knit and then again, my pearl. And the pearl, as I say it, is just because on the right side of the fabric, that's the resulting stitch. So when I call it a pearl, I'm looking at the right side of the work. So that's just a quick overview of fixing some mistakes. You can also undo your knits, unknit, by going into the loop below the one on the needle. So to refresh your memory, when we knit, we go into a stitch, wrap a new stitch on the right-hand needle, come through, Here's my new stitch, there was my old stitch. Now I'm going to discard my old stitch. If I need to get that old stitch back onto the left needle, I put my needle into the loop below the one that's on the right needle and I start to move it over. So this is just a little bit of a basic um, tinking, how to unknit, but it's helpful to know that kind of thing. So that's how you would unknit onto the left needle. Talking yeah. about twisting yeah. stitches and knowing how they face you the right way. Good question. So yes, and usually when I'm teaching my fixing mistakes class, that's what I lead with. Um, I'll go around the room actually and plant twisted stitches in my students' fabric <laughs> um, for them to fix. So here we go. When you're knitting, let me get my, this is a good time for marker. Okay. When you're knitting conventionally, your stitches should sit on the needle this way. So conventional knitting, Western knitting is done this way um, and your stitches sit just like this on the needle on the, and the stitch. So if we look closely, here's a little loop that comes around, that's a stitch. 
here's another one inside of it, etc. There's a column of stitches. Sometimes when you're fixing mistakes or depending on how you learned to knit, your stitch might sit on the needle crooked or twisted unconventionally. This where the front leg is in the back of the stitch. You want the front leg here. When you knit a stitch like this through the front, what ends up happening is that you twist your stitch as you knit it. And it creates a fabric that's um, not as elastic and smooth looking as regular stockinette. So this is a twisted stitch. And this is a conventional stitch. So our patterns are written for conventional knitting and not twisted knitting. So it's important if you are a twisted knitter, <laughs> if you uh, knit unconventionally, that you either can figure out how to change um, all the pattern instructions that would be affected by that, or that maybe you adjust the way you're knitting so that you can start knitting a little bit more conventionally. But one way to fix your twisted stitches when you are working on fixing mistakes, it can be easy to pick up a stitch and then put it on the needle and it's sitting in the wrong way. So here, this stitch is sitting the wrong way. I'll just I'll show you that drawing again. So you can see the back leg of the stitch is um, higher up on the needle. We want the front leg of the stitch higher up on the needle. This one should be further up. So there are a couple ways to fix this. One, you can move your stitch over and put it back onto the left-hand needle by untwisting it, and then proceed, then proceed with your knit stitch. Or my preference is to work through the back leg of the stitch. That untwists the stitch while also knitting the stitch. Right. So what you're doing is you're avoiding having to move your stitch over from the left needle to the right needle. When I go like this and then move it back, all of a sudden I've spent a lot of time moving that stitch over and the odds of it falling and getting into more trouble um, are higher. So I like to leave the stitch there and knit through the back leg like this. And you'll notice as I go and knit through the back leg, that's the same as if I had taken the stitch off the needle, put it back on. This is the same positioning. My needle is entering the stitch in the same way it would have if the stitch were twisted on the needle. So it's the same difference to knit through the back or right. purl through the back. Yeah. And it's I funny because that's exactly how I knit. And it's actually like the very common way of knitting in Russia and other Slavic places. Yes. They call it, I mean, they call it here the combination continental, yes. but they call it their grandma style. And it's basically <laughs> you're knitting through the leg of the stitch that's closest to your right hand needle. And yes. that's sure that it's untwist any kind of stitch. Gotcha. So I also wanted to demonstrate, because we had talked a bit about what our stitches look like, knits, purls, um, seaming. Once you know what your stitches look like, it's easy to join them together. So here we talked before about our stitches looking like a little letter V. There's another stitch here. When I want to join two pieces of work, I'm going to take an A, so the two edges of Vs on one side, to a V on the other side, a full stitch on the other side. So these are the two sides of stitches right here, an A to a V. A to a V. Here I'm working in stockinette stitch, so it's easy to see my stitches. Um, a to a V. There's a quick seam. And then I have a beautiful seam here where the two pieces come together. So when you can start recognizing what your stitches look like, everything else that you do in knitting becomes a little bit easier. So here I have garter stitch. I still have an A. Even though I've got garter stitch, I still have an A. And here is my V. They just take a little bit of digging. But once we can see these things and not fear working your seams or fixing mistakes or learning a new stitch, all of a sudden your knitting world will open up. If you don't have to rule out certain patterns because they have something you're afraid to try, your knitting will improve.
and yeah and just remember it's only knitting right you have to rip it you have to rip it it's you know just yarn it's all good <laughs> I mean I find it like actually empowering if you think about it that way like going into the pattern without worrying about techniques if you know them or not and just challenging yourself and it can be it doesn't have to be this huge thing right like when we thinking people all always intimidated but like when you when you say like let's go do fine lace or something right you see this huge mountain and you're thinking it's something unmountable and like you can't you can't even try it but if you think about breaking it into small manageable pieces you can do lace with fingering weight yarn right and just learn the basics and then slowly try thinner yarn and thinner needles and see where that's going to take you you can do simpler lace and then go into more sophisticated lace like just trying to do something small that you haven't tried before all those small steps always add up and I notice often that I would do it let's say a testing uh, project and I would learn something like one new tip and I would think like oh that's interesting and then the next project would come and it would require that exact technique and I would be like it's like the karma the life pre prepared me specifically for this <laughs> of information yes. right this new project like I already know how to deal with this problem and how to avoid mistakes in it but it's actually this accumulative little bits and pieces of wisdom that we accumulate along the knitting journey that makes us into better knitters somehow. Definitely. I would totally agree with you on that. Yes. If you'd like to learn more about Shayna, I interviewed her in episode 73. You can look that up and I'll put the link in the description. My next guest is a hand master knitter from the Knitting Guild Association, a book author and a designer, Charles Gandhi. So I'm putting together a compilation of mini interviews. Um, this Masters of the Trade, which I absolutely include you in that number. Thank and you. the topic is basically how can one become a better knitter and what does it mean to be a better knitter? So I wanted to pick your brain and I want to start with, so when I was interviewing you, you told me your um, story with uh, the Knitting Guild Association and your journey through that program and how you were so sure that you, were, you would fly through it and then your samples came back and you had to redo it and actually not even once, but twice. So the question that I have that I want to start with, if somebody like curious about becoming a better knitter and want to start being a better knitter, what would be the first step in your opinion? Well, you know, uh, our friend, um, Rinda Holiday, who uh, heads up TKGA, uh, the Knitting Guild Association, um, offers a course through TKGA called Basics, Basics, Basics. And I think that that would be a great place for someone who is confident in their knitting but wants to get better to start. Uh, I don't know the exact details about it, but they can contact, anyone can contact TKGA and go online. It's tkga.org. And uh, the description will be there. So... Um, I think that would be a very good place to start because what that does is it starts to at least identify what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. And right. Arenda takes a very hands-on approach to this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know from experience when I was a reviewer of the master's program, um, people that had gone through that basics, basics, basics course uh, did much better in the master's program because Arenda has opened up the doors to how you think and how you research and uh, all of that thing. So I think that's a very good place to start. Right. Well, one another story that you told me was about your tension between knitting and purling being very different and that you discovered that you didn't realize that until you start knitting samples and then you realize it through knitting those samples. And you told me about this exercise where you knit it and you basically cut a thread and then you compare the length of the thread on the knitting side and the purling side and see if your tension is different. How can, is there like an exercise in how you can even your tension? 
Well, I think um, that, um, and I want I want to clarify this a little bit. My tension was was kind of bad, but I never went through that exercise. But what what we what I noticed when I started reviewing people is that seventy five to eighty percent of the people that go through the first get the first swatches, their knitting does have those tension problems. I was lucky; I didn't have them so much. But one of my colleagues suggested this exercise, like you just mentioned, of, say, taking the same yarn, one in black and one in white, mm -hmm. and knitting across mm -hmm. and then purling back and cutting the selvages and unraveling it. Because mm -hmm. most people, mm -hmm. when they have what we call rowing, that's what, what you're talking about, is that on the back side, on the purl mm -hmm. side, you can see these, these ridges going across there. Uh, that is called rowing. Most people are purling too loosely. So, but in order to understand what they're doing, purling or knitting too loosely, they need to do that little exercise. Once they understand that, then it just becomes a mind game where you have to just purl a little tighter or knit a little tighter, depending on which one is loose. And before you know it, those, those situations will disappear. But being aware of what you're doing is the well, first thing. This is most, like... most people don't even realize they're doing these, this rowing. You know, being aware of your knitting is basically like a mindset, right? And I feel like becoming a better knitter depends on that curious mindset a lot, because you you have to want to become a better knitter in order to become a better knitter, like first and foremost, right? Exactly. You know what my my mantra is that I want my knitting to be handmade and not homemade. And I think that kind of summarizes it all. I get a little bit um, bemused or confused or even irritated a little bit when people make a mistake in their knitting and they don't want to take the time to fix it because they say nobody's going to see it but me. Well, you know, you're going to see it and you know it's there. I mean, I ripped out five inches yesterday or the other day because I found a mistake that I couldn't otherwise fix without ripping it out. It was a minor thing, but you know what? Every time I used that garment or saw that garment, I would see that mistake. And so it we're only knitting. So why not make it right and make it better? You know, I like to say there's good and there's better. And 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 I like to also think about knitting is one stitch at a time. And as long as you're conscious of that one stitch at a time, then um your knitting will be better and well you've okay. been knitting all your life since like very early childhood like you basically told me that you don't even remember learning to knit no no i don't knit. four or five i learned and i'm 73 now almost 74 so oh, you don't look a day over 60 these facials <laughs> i get it's these so decades of knitting and i still make mistakes yeah. But do you still feel like you're learning something new? Oh, you... every week. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, I designed a new shawl and I know about all the different cast stones and bind offs and things. And I normally do a long tail cast stone for the beginning of my work. And then if I have to add stitches in the middle of my work, I do a knitted cast stone because I find it easier to manipulate. Well, I was doing this design for this shawl and I did the knitted cast stone. And I didn't like the way it looked. It was loose and it was, so I tried another sample where I did the cable cast on and boom, there it was. The cable cast on was firmer and nicer. And here after all of these years of knowing about cable cast on and knitted cast on, I learned that if I want a loosey goosey cast on, I use the knitted cast on. If I want a firmer cast on, I use the cable cast on. So yes, you're constantly uh, learning something uh, internet's out so i can't watch netflix and knit so last night i got out some of my knitting books and i was just reading through some of barbara walker's um things and saw new stitch patterns that i had never even thought about so um now i'm anxious to go try those but so you're always learning even after seven decades <laughs> right well recently i was knitting a shetland lace shawl and the needles were the same exact color as the yarn and I was going blind like I was trying all different places to knit I was trying all different lighting and everything and I just like every time it would just the needles would blind me somehow like the there was no d difference between it so like I learned that way that for different yarns, you might need different color needles. Different needles, exactly, exactly. And also like I remember 
feeling my thumb was starting to hurt. And I realized that it was because I was knitting silk yarn on slippery stainless steel needles. And it I was gripping too tight, right? So to needle wooden them. needles, yeah, yeah. So how, how do you decide what kind of needles you use for what kind of project? Well, over time, I know if I'm doing a silk or a bamboo, I'm going to go to a wooden needle to start with. Um, I also know, like you were just saying, that if it's a dark yarn, I want to have some contrast in my needle. So I think it's just experience, uh, does it? And, you know, people laugh and say, why do you need so many needles? Well, that's the very reason that you need those different needles is because um, different yarns require different needles. And um, no, I, I think and I had it's interesting. I think it's called Likey, the Likey Corporation. They came out with a you know, they have five or six different finishes on their needles for their interchangeables and they have a one that's called blush which is a nice pink color and one of our one of my colleagues at the local yarn shop where I work a couple of days a week bought those needles just out of a whim because she liked the pink color but she came in and she said I love them because the contrast between the yarn and the needles is so good so I think a lot of that has to do with experience and and knowing what yarns and also if you're having problems if you're having problems with your yarn slipping off, then try a new needle. Now, be warned, your gauge may change. So, uh, because sometimes different, because you knit differently when you're, you know, you're gripping tight. Like you said, your thumb was getting things. Right. So if you're, if you're gripping tighter, that means your gauge is going to be tighter. So when you change needles, kinds of needles, you may have to check your gauge to make sure that it's, um, that, it, that it doesn't change. So be careful with that. Well, when we're talking about gauge, like I sort of treat it as a necessary evil. Like it's not my favorite thing to do. And if there is a way to avoid it, I usually try to find that way. Did you come to love gauging? I love gauging. I love gauging. And I don't understand why people don't like it. First of all, I knit tons of swatches all day long when I'm trying to come up with a new idea or a new project. I'll do it. And I'm working on a new design that I started yesterday and I probably have already made five or six different gauges, number number one gauges, and also working out details of how I'm going to do this and do that. So a gauge is a great way to, number one, not only get your size correct, but more importantly, to test these things that we're talking about, about the, the kind of needle you use. Or whether you go up just one needle or down one needle, if that's going to make a difference in the way it feels, the hand. I just don't understand why people don't want to take an hour or two to make a gauge and get their fabric just the way they want it instead of just jumping into it and then it doesn't fit or it looks sloppy or who knows what. So, yeah, I love gauges. My only regret is I haven't saved all my swatches that I made. My that gauges. was my next question. What do you do with those swatches? Well, I save them for a while and I'm not nearly as organized as I would like to think I am, but I think it would be wonderful, wouldn't it, to have a big board full of all these gauge swatches and, and it would bring back, be like a souvenir book almost that would bring back memories. But Do you have I any love... pet peeve of like what people do or what mistakes knitters make like often? Well, I think that gauge thing is a big one. And I'll give you a, a good example. I designed a hat called the Hallgrim hat that there've been many, many, many knitters have made that hat. It's a twist, twisted traveling stitch thing. And it's uh, it's intended to be a little bit tighter gauge and the twisting traveling stitches make it a little tighter, but I wanted good stitch definitions because it's kind of a, kind of a woven look to it. Well, I, I had this woman write me a nasty note on Ravelry, posting it all over Ravelry, that this hat pattern is rubbish, she said, rubbish. And and she said, it's this hat is big enough to be a skirt, not a hat. Well, I wrote her back and I said, did you get gauge? And she wrote back in big, bold, underlined letters, I do not knit gauge swatches. So I just wrote her back and said, duh. <laughs> And then I deleted her nasty comments. So that's one of my pet peeves. Uh, I think the second one I've already talked about is not not trying to take care of mistakes. Um, and let's see if there's any other big things that. Um, oh, I think another one that that is important is not choosing the correct yarn for the pattern that you're doing. For instance, if 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 it's a if it's a heavily lace pattern or a heavily heavily cabled pattern. That's not the time and place to use some 
multicolored variegated yarn because all your work particularly in lace will just get lost right in your yarn so let the yarn i mean look at the project you're doing and look at the yarn you have and see if they are compatible with one another so i think those those are three kind of <laughs> pet right. peeves well, one thing we talked about, you actually taught me that trick and I have been using it ever since. You told me about the right leaning decreases and the left leaning decreases and that the way you remember which one is which is that me two together have the R in it. So it's the right leaning decrease and the other one doesn't. So it's the left leaning decrease. Isn't that a good idea? <laughs> it's brilliant. Like I've been using it ever since and I've been telling it to everyone. There is like multiple ways of doing decreases. Do you have a favorite? Because I was noticing that like some people do the need to together and some people slide the stitch over to create the same. Uh, well, again, I think it depends on the project uh, that you have to analyze what. And this this is another reason that knitting swatches is important. You see in a swatch you can, with the project you're doing, you can do a little stitch pattern and you can try different increases and different decreases on a little swatch and see which one looks better. And so what I'll do on a swatch is I will do part of my pattern and I'll I'll do, do down below, I'll do this increase or this decrease. And then at the, on the same swatch, I'll go up a little bit and do, do different increases or different decreases. Not only am I getting gauge, but swatches are more are more than just gauge. They're for technique too. So by doing that different increases and decreases on the particular stitch pattern that I'm doing within that swatch, I can then look, I can block it. I can block my swatch and I can then look at that swatch and decide for that particular project, what is the best increase or the best decrease. Is and there anything in your knitting that you do not block? Anything I do not block. Um, I can't, uh, I guess, uh, well, I make, I make these little toys for my, when I, I don't make baby blankets anymore, I make baby toys. I don't block those, but um, that's about the only thing. I mean, I believe in blocking. It's kind of like swatching, blocking and swatching. Right. I mean, I'm a deep believer in that. Like I block absolutely everything. It makes I such a huge it. difference. Yeah. It makes a big difference. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to ask you, like talking about Barbara Walker's um, what she did in her book is bring together basically the whole wide world of knitting. So she was showing different techniques, different stitch patterns from different parts of the world. And I noticed that, for example, the Eastern Europeans, and I noticed it talking to a friend who is from Serbia and I was originally from Russia and we were talking about how the edging is knitted in those parts of the world. And they always slip the first stitch and purl the last stitch to create neater edges, right? And the first stitch is not gonna be that um, stretched basically by slipping it purl wise. Do you learn something from different parts of the world from the knitters from different countries? Oh, I certainly do, particularly from in stitch patterns. I think, in fact, I wish sometime I could call you and have you translate some Russian patterns oh, for me. You, absolutely. Anytime. Because I think that the Russians are doing beautiful um, stitch patterns that we don't necessarily do. And and I can sometimes understand the charts, but many times I can't. And it would be nice if I could at some point in time know some of those Russian things. So I, I'm intrigued by Russian stitch patterns. I'm intrigued by Japanese stitch patterns. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, you know, it's like, oh, and, and you know, the Boohoo designs um, from... Um, where is that? Is that Sweden or I forget where Bo, Bo, Bohus, you know, where they do stranded knitting with pearls on the outside. It's the only place I know that does stranded knitting with pearls on the right side. I'm talking about P-U-R-L-S. I just finished a piece where I use P-E-A-R-L-S. So I'm having to make sure. <laughs> that. So, yeah, I think you pick up something from from everywhere if you're open to it. You know, you have to just kind of uh, look at things. And I think the Internet's helped us a lot with that. Uh, and one nice thing about the Russian stuff, a lot of times I can watch a Russian YouTube video and I don't have to understand the language. I can watch their hands right. and see what they're doing. So um, well, that makes knitting such an international, like it's a, another language, because if you can just watch somebody, you can understand yeah, what they say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it is an international 
language and every every region and country has contributed something to it. I think it's interesting the United States, the only thing I know that has been contributed to the world of knitting is Barbara Walker's mosaic knitting. Uh, I think that's the only thing that we can go to and say that's something that really happened here. Other regions, you know, in Bavaria, you have twisted traveling stitches. In in uh, Norway, you have those beautiful snowflake patterns. The Isle of Faral, you have Faral knitting. Uh, oh, that's a pet peeve of mine. You ask about pet peeves? That's the biggest pet peeve of mine is that everybody is now calling any kind of stranded knitting Faral knitting. And feral knitting is a very specific form of stranded knitting. Feral mm -hmm. is stranded knitting, but not all stranded knitting is feral knitting. And anytime anybody uses two colors and makes a pattern, they call it feral. Well, they're wrong. Feral is a very specific form of stranded knitting, and it needs to balance top and bottom. It needs to balance left and right. I mean, it's it needs to have a peri pattern and a border pattern and a square pattern. And I mean, there's a lot of tradition in feral knitting. So you see, I'm, I'm getting worked up about that. I'm, I can't believe I didn't <laughs> bring that up to begin with. But feral knitting is not, uh, stranded knitting is not always feral knitting. And even professional people just use the word blankly. It's like rubbing fingernails against the chalkboard for me. So uh, anyway, I, I got off <laughs> what we were talking about, but um I thought about one other thing that I think people might be interested that I do a lot trying to make my knitting better. Uh, I do what I might call my Saturday knitting. And that is if there are 10 ways to make a bobble and there are probably 50 ways to make a bobble, I'll get down every book I have and I'll go online and look at every way I can. And I will make a big swatch with every bobble I can possibly make. And I will number them and I will notate how I did it and whether I like to do it or not do it. Now, those swatches I do say. And that way, when I get ready to do a project, I can look at my bobble sample and, and my notes and decide which bobble is appropriate for what I'm doing. The same thing with SSKs. You know, there are probably five or six ways to make an SSK, which is the better way. Well, I've done my Saturday knitting for it. So I know which one for me is the better way to do it. So um, I think that's a little tip for people just to uh, research all the different ways of doing stuff. And then there's no right and wrong. There's good and better and what works for you and what works for the project. So, uh, but you've got to be exposed to all that and you've got to research all that. Right. I loved reconnecting with Charles. We had the best time. If you'd like to learn more about Charles, you can watch episode 125 where there is a full-size interview with him. My next guest is a knitting instructor and a knitwear designer, Anakin Ellis. You've been teaching around like for quite a while and not to mention that you have, I don't even remember how many hundreds of designs under your belt, but that's a lot of hundreds there. Um, yes. <laughs> Is there like a pet peeve of yours that you see a lot and it's like irritates you and you wish that people paid attention to that or knew about that? I think from a designer point of view, probably uh, knitters ignoring tension or gauge and not um, bothering to knit a, a, a gauge swatch before they start knitting because I think a lot of problems that knitters have could have been solved if they'd actually knitted a gauge swatch before they um, started the project. People have a lot of like love-hate relationship with swatching, right? And it's like, it has this bad reputation for something dreadful that you sort of have to do, but nobody really feels like doing it. And what's the point anyway? What is the point of swatching? Like what can people learn from swatching? So I think there are several things. Um, one, I think, depending on where you're knitting, tension or gauge is important. So if you have uh, the wrong number of stitches per inch or centimeter, whichever measurement you're working in, it can affect the size. So if, obviously for garments and things that have to fit properly, that makes a big difference. For things that don't really need to fit an exact size, like shawls or scarves or certain accessories, I think swatching is still important because it gives you a feel for the yarn. Do you actually like working with the yarn? If you don't like knitting a small swatch, you're not going to enjoy knitting a whole garment or shawl or whatever in it. Um, 
Do you know all the techniques used in the uh, where you're going to knit? Are there things that you need to practice? Um, are there complicated cables? For example, a friend of mine once wanted to knit a sweater which had a cable which used two cable needles at the same time, um, <laughs> which I must admit I'd never done before. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want to say to her, I think this is too difficult for you, because she was very, very basic, very novice knitter. So I said, just buy one ball of yarn, try and knit a swatch, and then let me know what you think. And she said, no, I can't knit this, it's too complicated. Um, so practicing techniques, are there any shaping techniques? Uh, you can also practice uh, washing. So if it's something that you know you're going to want to wash, if it says superwash and it says that you can machine wash, is that actually true? Because I machine washed stuff before that said superwash that felted, uh, mostly socks. It wasn't like a big project or anything. Yeah. So it might be worth testing the washing instructions and just different things like that. Make, I think the main thing is checking your tension and making sure you actually enjoy working with the yarn. And do you have the correct needles for the job, for example? Um, does the needles and the yarn work well together? Because I find that some needles are more comfortable for certain yarns. I think some yarns and some needle types like wood, metal, whatever, don't go together that well. <laughs> right, and I learned it the hard way because I was knitting a shawl and it was Shetland lace shawl. And it was this pale, pale pink, it was beautiful color. And of course the needles that I had in that size were pale, pale silver. And I couldn't see any difference. Like I was blind yeah, yeah. in every stitch. So it's like, we don't talk enough about the importance of the right needles for the right yarn, for the right color, yeah, yeah. And the right texture of yarn, right? Because like some of it's slippery and some are more stickier. So you need yeah. sleekier needles for the stickier yarn basically and vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, I think that's one of the things um, that I see a lot in my classes, because I quite often will ask people to bring, for example, circular needles um, and they will bring a circular needle. And sometimes they are quite nice circular needles. Sometimes they're absolutely awful. And if you have somebody who doesn't normally use circular needles, they may not know the difference between you know, no one circle needle from another really and how important, especially the join from the needle tip to the cable is. Mm -hmm. And I have seen people just buy the cheapest circle needle they can find and bring it to the class and they just can't do whatever it is we're doing, especially if we're doing magic loop. I think with magic loop, especially having good quality circle needles that have a good join from the cable to the needle tip is very important. And um, I don't want to say to somebody, I don't think those needles are going to be any good. So sometimes I will let them try it or I will say, have you used those needles before? Um, and if they say no, then I might say, well, actually, I think if you borrow a set of my needles, you might get on better. But I have had people in classes before where I've had to actually uh, change their needles for a set of my own needles because their needles were just holding them back too much and they just couldn't do not they can do what they were wanting to do, not because they didn't have the skills, but just because the needles were so awful. When we talk about proper equipment or good yarn to knit with, right? Like when somebody just trying to get into knitting, what would be your mm. advice? Like as far as like what they should invest in and what they can wait with? So I do think um, some nice needles are important. Don't just buy the cheapest ones you can find. Now, obviously, as we develop as knitters, we all have our preferences, some like metal, some like wood. But I think if you're a new knitter, uh, probably wooden needles might be the best and wooden needles that aren't too blunt because some wooden needles can be very, very blunt. So wooden needles that have a reasonable point, uh, don't have to be like super pointed, but not too blunt either. Um, and wooden needles sort of smooth because I have seen some very rough ones. Right. And also I think the best yarn to knit with, especially when you're a new knitter, is uh, pure wool. Uh, it can be superwash wool, but wool or something that has a high wool content. It's very, very tempting to just buy the cheapest yarn you can find, some cheap acrylic or something. But I do think a good wool yarn, and you know, you can get quite good wool yarns at quite cheap price, um, especially superwash wool. 
and it just makes your knitting look better. So if you have a wool yarn, which has several plies, so several strands of yarn kind of twisted together, that makes your knitting look better because wool has memories that it will kind of bounce back. So as you knit, your stitches are never going to be exactly even, but wool will kind of even out the differences in your stitches um, and will look better than, for example, acrylic. So I do think it is better to spend a couple of pounds or dollars more and buy some slightly better yarn if you can afford it, because I do think it makes a difference. And I think whatever you do, do not buy cotton when you're a nude knitter. Cotton is, I mean, there are some nice cotton yarns out there, but on the whole, cotton is very hard on your hands. And I don't think it's ideal for um, new knitters to practice with. The same thing goes for very slippery yarns like silk and bamboo. They're very, very slippery. And I think they can be too slippery when you're a new knitter. Right. So I think a good wool or wool blend yarn is uh, one of my preferred options. Well, I'm like, I'm relatively, and it's becoming like less, uh, I can say it less and less, right? But I'm still a relatively new knitter. Like I started knitting five years ago and I noticed that I've learned a ton, like every time I'm doing a new project and until today, like every single time I'm doing a new project, I'm learning something new, whether what I should pay attention to or whether what kind of needles I should use or some new technique. There's always something like some new piece of information that like fits that puzzle that makes you into a better knitter eventually, right? Mm, but yeah. is there like some things that people should like when they just get into the knitting like I feel like all the all the things that I've learned I learned it on my own mistakes like I would first yeah. do something that was detrimental to my knitting or to my health you know and then I would learn <laughs> how not to how to avoid it is there like some basics that people should concentrate on like when they first starting to knit like what's the most important skills you think one needs to have I think one of the most important things is to learn to fix your mistakes because we all we all make mistakes. And I think probably the more experience you get, the probably bigger mistakes you make because you tend to make knit more complicated things. So you make bigger mistakes. And I've seen so many knitters just hand their knitting to whoever taught them to knit. If they're lucky enough to have somebody who taught them to knit who lives with them or near them. So I had a knitter in the class once who would uh, take all her knitting mistakes to her mum for her mum to fix them. Well, this knitter was in her 50s and her mum was, I guess, probably around 80. So, you know, you get to a point at that age when you need to start fixing your own knitting because your mum's not going to be around forever. And she was a very good knitter, but she couldn't just couldn't fix her mistakes. So in the class, when she, when she handed her knitting to her mum to to unpick a few stitches, I kind of handed this straight back and say, no, let's show you how to actually do this. And I do think learning to unpick um, without dropping all the stitches off your needles, learning to pick up drop stitches and learning to fix mistakes. And you don't have to learn to fix all the really complicated mistakes straight away, just learn to fix the easy ones. So if your stitch slides off your needle, learn how to pick it up again learn what your knitting is supposed to look like. So each time you learn a new technique, really look at your knitting and see what it's supposed to look like, because you're not gonna be able to recognize if your stitch is twisted, for example, if you don't know what it's supposed to look like. So if I say to you, is your stitch is sitting correctly on your needle? You're not gonna know that unless you know how it's supposed to sit on the needle. So start noticing things like that straight away and I know to start with one knit probably looks the same as another or, or one stitch looks the same as another stitch you know it's um a lot of it probably doesn't make much sense when you're first starting out and it's such a long time since I learned to knit that I can't really remember <laughs> what it was like being a brand new knitter uh, but I have challenged myself to learn new techniques over the years and I get a little bit of a taste then for what it's like to be a new knitter um, but I do think looking at your knitting and just learning to recognize the base, basics, so the difference between a knit and a purl stitch, um, what the knit side of your knitting looks like, what the purl side of your knitting looks like, what it looks like when you're doing garter stitch, um, and 
not panic if you make a mistake, just take a deep breath and then try and work out how to fix it. You can find videos online for most things these days. You've got to be a bit careful because not everything on YouTube is uh, correct. Sometimes people will very confidently launch into how to do a technique or how to fix a mistake and then they do it completely wrong. <laughs> So, but you know, there's plenty of information around, so you can find the most of the information you need. And um, if you need to um, ask somebody in person, then do that. But I do think, don't be afraid of making mistakes. Don't let the fear of making mistakes hold you back. Um, you were saying you've only been knitting for five years, was it? I mean, I know people who've knitted for 50 years who don't knit half the stuff that you knit because some of the things that you knit like the Shetland shawls um the uh Stephen West mystery shawls things like that some of them are quite complicated and I know people who knitted for 50 years and all they do is knit and purl and they're frightened of trying anything slightly more complicated so I think it's less about how many years you've been knitting and more about challenging yourself and trying new techniques and don't, not being afraid of trying new stuff um, I mean, if but you I make know a so many, like you do a lot of lace designs, right? And I do a lot of lace knitting. And it's mm. honestly like it's not even clear to me why people are so afraid of lace because to me it's, a, but again, like I have very mathematical engineering minds. So to me, like you give me a chart, it's, it's like obvious to me, right? But a lot of people mm. like afraid of charts and they want to written instructions and I understand that we're all different and some people find something easier and other things more difficult what it is that prevents us from learning new things like why we are so afraid of like stepping outside of what we already know do you think I think that's something that comes with age I think as when we're children if you think about it kids learn new stuff every single day young children learn new stuff every single day and as we get older we learn fewer and fewer new things and I think when I was a teenager any knitting thing didn't really face me I just kind of gave it a go and if I couldn't do it I asked my mum and um i if I wasn't happy with it, I just ripped it out and knitted something else. And it didn't really worry me. Now I'm much more cautious because I worry about failure more. And I think that's just an age thing. And I try and kind of remind myself that, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen if I make a mistake? But I do think it is very much, as we get older, we learn fewer and fewer new things. And I think because not just with knitting, but when you think about technology, we live in such a fast moving world where it's really important to, um, keep on top of new developments and learning new stuff because if nothing else there's always going to be new technology we have to learn so if you can keep challenging yourself to learn new things regularly whether it is knitting another craft a foreign language you know how to use your phone properly you know anything how to use your new car you know all those sort of things I think the more new stuff we learn the easier we find it to learn new stuff I don't know whether psychologically or like mechanically in our brain that makes sense but to me that seems to make a lot of sense because I think that's the biggest difference between children and adults is the fact that the kids are used to learning new stuff all the time and as adults we're not. Well I also find that like a lot of times the technique that has a bad reputation like brioche or like intarsia or like lace right if you break it into something smaller pieces smaller segments right if it's not the entire brioche thing like you have behind you but like you know a little stripe of brioche where you can mm. undo it a couple of times if you make a mistake right or if it's not the entire thing of lace but just a strip of lace and some simple lace right even like learning how to do the need to together yarn over it can turn things into lacy things right mm. so yeah. I feel like if you break it for yourself into like small manageable pieces and instead of going right away for you know full-blown square Shetland lace shawl you start with like a little lacy motif in fingering weight yarn like people think it's all or nothing lots of times where yeah, yeah I agree do something I think simple. it's yeah I think starting with something simple and also most things are easy if you're using um, slightly thicker yarns I'm not saying go for chunky yarn because I think chunky yarn is more difficult to knit with but going for something like uh, DK weight or Aaron weight yarn, 
um, sort of like a medium weight yarn. And, you know, for example, say you want to knit, say your goal is to knit a really complicated Shetland shawl. Um, you know, I mean, some people might cast on for a Shetland shawl to start with, because if you don't know it's supposed to be difficult, you don't know it's supposed to be difficult. So some right. people might just go for it, but you probably get frustrated very quickly. But you might just buy a book or download a pattern that you want to knit and then just knit a small section of the motif. So just choose a small section, practice those stitches, because in most things like lace knitting, even brioche, um, there are just a few stitches that make up the pattern. So in lace knitting, you're talking about, you know, three or four, well, left leaning, right leaning decreases and double decreases usually, right. and yarn overs. They are what makes up all the motifs in lace knitting. So once you've got those stitches, once you practice those stitches and you've learned those maneuvers, you just have to put them together in different ways. And it's the same thing with brioche. Once you've learned how to do the increases and the decreases that make, you know, fancy brioche patterns like this, um, you're just combining them in different ways. But I think especially with, I've been teaching a lot of brioche this year for the first time, and that's been a real eye opener because with lace knitting, I found that people were learning the stitches and progressing quite quickly. With brioche, I found that people really struggle, struggle to get the hang of the basics. So just a basic two color brioche rib. I didn't realize how long, how difficult some people find that, um, which was a bit of an eye opener for me. So I've been trying to like work on different ways of explaining it and different ways of like teaching it to make it easier for people. Um, and um, I think I'm kind of getting there, but it's been quite a bit of an eye opener for me because I didn't find brioche that difficult because I just viewed it as lace knitting. And once I put like my lace brain to it, I found it quite easy because I think it is very similar to lace knitting in a lot of ways. So funny, like the first time I tried brioche, I jumped right in into the most complicated brioche scarf, which I had to make for a friend of mine. And <laughs> I was also on deadline because it was his birthday was coming up, right? It took mm. me 18 times to completely unravel oh, wow. it until it finally like that light bulb clicked, you know, and I understood how to yeah, do it. Yeah. But it took yeah, me yeah. Like, some struggling at the very beginning. And it, and it was mostly because I couldn't figure out how to fix it. Like once I would make yeah. a mistake, I wouldn't know how to like go down to rows, right? So like that moment of like final understanding, but I wish I thought about like looking at some fixing brioche mistakes tutorial at the time. I just like, I was brand new to the knitting and very naive about the whole, like where to find information, <laughs> you know, but it's uh, it can be challenging at the beginning, but like, I feel like once you get it, it's with you, like you get it. Yeah, I do think there is a lot to be said for your expectations of things. I mean, yes, brioche, whether you think it's going to be easy or difficult, brioche can be challenging because it is quite different from a lot of other knitting that we're used to doing uh, because of the, the way the stitches are made up. Um, but I think with a lot of things, we have this kind of preconceived idea about whether something's going to be difficult or easy. And I've met knitters who've been knitting for years and years and years and do very basic things. I've got met knitters who've been knitting for like six months and they're already trying to knit socks right. or they come into my lace workshops or whatever. Um, I had a knitter in a workshop a few weeks ago who'd only been knitting for a few months and she'd already knitted a sweater. And she came to my finishing workshop to learn how to sew it all up together to make it look nice. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that she didn't know how to sew it up didn't stop her knitting the sweater she just knitted all the pieces of the sweater and then she was worrying about how she's going to sew it up to make it look the way she wanted it to look so I do think that um, sometimes our expectations if we keep telling ourselves it's going to be difficult it might be more difficult um, at the same time I don't like to say to knitters this is really, really difficult because then I think that put kind of like a block in their mind on them expecting it to be difficult. But I also don't want to say this is really, really easy because then if they do find it difficult, then they feel like a failure because they can't do it because they think, well, if she says it's easy and I can't do it, so therefore I can't be very bright or whatever. 
Um, so I do think it's difficult to get that balance between, I mean, the thing with knitting is whatever you do, if you make a mistake, just rip it out and try again. You know, it's not like cutting a fabric where if you cut it too small, you, you know, you just got to make something smaller, you know, you've ruined the fabric kind of thing. You're not going to ruin it by knitting with it and then ripping it out. I mean, if you rip it out 20 times, the yarn might not look very good by the end of it, but, you know, you can rip it out two or three times at least and try again. Um, and if you're making something that is important, that matters a lot, then it is a good idea to practice first. Uh, so that when you're making the real thing, you're less likely to make a mistake. Well, let me ask you another thing. Like you've designed so many designs and a lot of people are intimidated by designing because they think like, well, what do I know? Like it's all been done. Like what new can I come up with, right? Is there a way to learn how to become a designer? Like, is there some steps people can take to free themselves and allow themselves to try designing? I, there probably is because I mean you can go to college and learn how to design. Um, I mainly started designing because I didn't like following other people's instructions. <laughs> so I don't like following pat other people's patterns. I don't like following when I'm cooking. I don't like following recipes. Um, I so that's the main reason why I started designing was because I just didn't like following patterns. So I was just basically knitting my own thing and doing my own thing without thinking about it too much. And then somebody on an internet forum many, many years ago said, like 16, 17 years ago probably, said, you should write that up. And I'm like, well, I can't do that because I'm got a clue how to do that. And after time, because even that, because I'm from Norway, um, I'd lived in the UK for quite a few years at that time and my English was fairly fluent, but I didn't understand English knitting patterns because knitting, whatever language you're reading your pattern in, whatever language you speak, knitting is a little bit of a different language, but all the abbreviations and things like that. And I didn't understand English knitting terminology very well at that point. Um, so that was my first thing was to learn English knitting terminology. But I think when it comes to, it's easy to be intimidated. I think now it's almost easier to become a designer, but it's also more difficult because now with so much available online, which wasn't around when I started uh, designing because internet, I mean, Ravelry, for example, wasn't around when I started designing and social media wasn't a thing yet. I think now with, so much stuff on Ravelry and social media in some ways it's easier because you can find resources easier but you can also find more people to compare yourself with easier so you might look at people and think well there's so many great designers why bother you know what can I contribute but the problem is that shouldn't stop you from trying because if you feel like you want to design your own thing then just give it a go um, I think the more you design, the more ideas you come up with, the more ideas you get. I find that if I have a design submission I need to work on for a magazine, I will get an email from the editor and I'll think I've got no ideas. My brain is empty. I can't think of anything. I don't think I'll ever design anything ever again. And then I make myself do it because I have to, because I want the job, because I want to get paid for it. <laughs> so I start working on an idea and then um as I work on one idea I get more ideas and then that just spirals and I get more and more ideas and before I know it I'm I've got my, like my three ideas that I want to submit to that magazine but the ideas just keep coming kind of thing so I think the more you just start trying things the more the more the ideas keep flowing kind of thing um, like creativity feeds creativity. But I think if you want to design, just give it a go. Start with something easy. I started designing socks, which may not sound like the easiest thing to design, but because I had like a basic sock template in my mind, I just added a stitch pattern to it. I used my basic sock template, you know, cast on 60 stitches, that kind of thing. And then I just added a stitch pattern to it. And then and, that, and it was the same thing when I started designing shawls. I had like a basic template of a, um, I think my first shawl was a top down triangular shawl, I think. I just had like a basic template in my mind 
to start with, I, I only used stitch pattern repeats that were eight stitches because I knew how I could incorporate that easily to make the charts kind of flow from one to the other because the shawl I'd knitted from somebody else's pattern used eight stitches. So to start with, all my pattern repeats were eight stitches because I couldn't think beyond that. And then I realized that I could make them others. You know, I could use 10 stitches or 12 stitches or whatever. Um, I think the main thing to start with is use something you're already familiar with and then just add a different stitch pattern or change the shape slightly, depending on where you're knitting. Um, I think with like garments and things, maybe just try and alter the shape of it slightly, um, just to kind of get your confidence that you can actually do it. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's the same. It's both like knitting and designing has the same in common that you just have to allow yourself to try and maybe make mistakes along the way, but just trying sort of introduces you to new possibilities in knitting. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I think the most difficult thing when it comes to designing these days is getting noticed you know, actual designing something isn't that difficult. Writing up the pattern so that other people can follow it and getting noticed is more difficult. So if you want to actually become a professional designer and sell your patterns, I think that's a lot more difficult because there's so many designers these days. And I think getting noticed is a lot more difficult than actually designing something. Mm -hmm. um, and also if you want to actually publish something you need to not just be able to design it and knit it you also need to be able to write the pattern and if it's a sweater or something you need to write it in several sizes so there's a lot more to it than just the coming up with the idea and idea and kind of executing it um there's quite a lot more to it which i didn't realize when i started that i think if i'd realized that i probably might not have tried because that would have been too intimidated that's the by whole it thing, right like if i realized that shetland place was difficult i wouldn't jump into it but yeah like, if yeah you just do something then things become manageable along the way somehow you figure yeah, it out. yeah. this yeah, is how exactly. the youtube channel happened as well i first started yeah. and then tried to figure out what it is that i'm doing actually <laughs> yeah yeah that's right if you'd like to learn more about anakin you can watch episode 113 where i interviewed her I hope you enjoyed this program. Please let me know in the comments what you thought about it. And if you are new to my channel, please consider subscribing. Thank you very much and happy meeting.